look at my race car. See, you gotta go for a second. I'm on a race car. I'm on a race car. Do 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 do. I'm on a race car. Okay, let's see. Are we live? Are we gonna? Is it gonna be weird? This is when I start acting goofy to try to be entertaining before we know if we're actually live yet. Oh, there we are. Boom. And we're live. Hello, everybody. Oh, yeah, you gotta. Okay, so, uh, hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's town hall on education. I'm Erica Reddick. This is Generally Irritable. And uh, today I have a couple of guests with me. One is my uh, illustrious sister, Shannon Bundy. And she is an educator here in Vermont. She's been uh, working as a teacher for 20 years? 17. 17 years. It's basically 20 years. Basically 20 Okay, years. close enough for government work, as they say, uh, which is what we're going for, right? Government work. I'm trying to be elected to Senate. So therefore, 17 equals 20. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, seriously, though. Uh, Shannon, you worked at, can, can we say where you work and where you work? So Shannon started her career at MBU in Swanton. And then where did you move to? And then I moved to Winooski High School. And now I'm at Burlington Technical Center. Yeah. And what do you teach? Currently, I am a work-based learning coordinator, oh, yeah. which okay. means that my role is to get students into internships and co-ops and get employers to work with our students and instructors, that's the nutshell. So little plug there, if you are a small business owner or someone who you like have some kind of trade or something where you think you ha could uh, benefit from having interns and where said interns could benefit, you should call Burlington Technical Center and talk to Shannon. Are there any careers or businesses in particular that you're looking for right now? Well, can I say what our programs are? Really yeah, quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have an aviation program. So anything related to planes, we would love to talk to you, even if you work on your own or a pilot, etc. Okay. We have criminal justice. We have culinary arts. We have two health sciences programs. So we're looking for anybody in the health sciences field to be a guest speaker or anything like oh, that as well. Like acupuncture, even and stuff acupuncture, like that. Acupuncture. Uh, homeopathic oh, well, stuff. I need that we later. Yeah. Love that. We'll yeah. get you some people. Don't let me put it that way. Okay. We have an advanced manufacturing program, a welding program. We have a uh, human services, which is a huge spectrum. Um, we, because we have our own preschool in our building. Um, we have Go all faster. We also have design and illustration <laughs> and digital media. So if anybody wants to reach out to me to talk about being a guest speaker or anything of the like, let me know. I love it. Okay, so, but you did teach science. Oh, I, yes. I was a high school science teacher for 16 years. Okay, so that's what, that's what that is. Okay, now also with me this evening is my good friend, Jeff Comstock, um, who is, now, Jeff, you were a soil scientist, right? Yes. And for Vermont Ag. Yeah, with the Vermont Agency of Agriculture. So just so you know, Shannon, do you also yell at people when they call soil dirt? Absolutely. <laughs> <clears throat> Not grow plants in dirt. That's right. Whatever, right. okay? You nerdy science people. Um, All of the middle, middle school students that I worked with over the years when my kids were in school at Lyman C. Hunt now know that soil is not dirt. <laughs> I've been yelled at her by her so many times. Um, now, Jeff, so. you obviously, you're a soil scientist. You have a specialty in ag and, and in science like that. But tonight I've asked you to come on and talk about education. Um, I was super fascinated when you shared with me the presentation that you and Nancy and others had put together for us here in the new north end of Burlington, showing the um, sort of the, the really crazy way that our education system is both funded and 
recorded the way that they're tracking all of the information. Um, so Jeff, I would just like to say, I just want to brag. Can I humble brag on you? Can I, hum can you humble brag on a person? Yes. Is that a thing? So I just love Jeff. For those of you that don't know, Jeff and Nancy, um, are both retired and his wife, Nancy. Um, and they said when they retired, we want to still be involved in our community and we want to make sure that we're participating and sharing the wisdom that we've earned over the years. And and really make a, a make it a better place. And so I love it. That's how I met Jeff uh, was the neighborhood planning assembly here in Burlington. And so I'm just really excited to have both of you here with me tonight to shed some light on education funding and outcomes here in Vermont. Uh, this is a big question. A lot of debate happens. Uh, a lot of uh, here. Let me. We're going to do this. Let's figure out. Here, let me. I'm trying to figure out the spacing for us. <laughs> Okay, so Jeff, what do you think? So we, I'll, okay, here's where I'll start. Sarah Carpenter all the time, one of our city councilors here in Burlington has this talking point that she repeats regularly. She says that 75% of our property taxes go to education funding. Would you say that that is an accurate statistic or percentage? I would say that uh, the actual number is probably between uh, 65 and 70. That is our family experience mm, okay. over the years. And that number may vary some for others, depending upon whether they're income sensitized or not in the way that they pay their property taxes. Okay, got it. And so then now, uh, now your thing that some, a lot of people maybe don't know is that, or what I saw in your presentation is that it's not just our property taxes that are funding education. Is that correct? Uh, oh, yes. And that, that's actually uh, was one of the core motivations for this uh, community forum that um, we helped organize with the help of some other NPA members and school board members uh, that we that occurred back in November of 2018. Mm. And, and one of our underlying issues that we wanted to address was the general what we saw as a general lack of understanding about how education is actually funded what goes into the budget when people actually vote on it you know that we just felt like there was a huge uh degree of misunderstanding yeah and so although much of the conversation about education funding was revolves around property taxes yeah uh, you know, it's important, uh, and one of the things that we learned with the help of some folks from the state tax department and the education agency <clears throat> is that there's several other significant sources of funding in addition to homestead education and the non-homestead or, uh, you know, property taxes. And it, so, those hold on, are, Jeff. Yes. I'm gonna. Sh I'm actually gonna share that screenshot. Okay. Let's see. I, I can't wait. Let's see how this is to our to our viewers. Okay. So this is what I was gonna talk to, and as you can see from this block chart, that mm -hmm. the non-homestead education property tax actually uh, contributes about forty-one percent of the total education fund. Homestead. Uh, property taxes is 26%. And currently in Vermont, 100% of our sales tax and 33% of our use tax, like when you buy a car and uh, motor vehicle registration, uh, that money also goes to the education fund and provides 26% of the funding to education. And then as you can see down below, there's... Um, you know, meals and rooms tax, purchase and use, and the lottery 
provide, you know, an, another significant contribution to the education fund. So there how, are. Do you know how it ended up over the years that that was like, how did we, how did we start taking um, more and more money from all of these different funding sources? Do you know what I mean? Do you know what the, like, what the impetus was to sort of start taking more for that budget? Was it the education budget spilled over or was that there wasn't enough money to fund? Well, I guess that would be the same thing, wouldn't it? Eventually. Essentially, yes, that the education fund um, in 2018 was about $1.6 billion, uh, larger than the total general fund, the rest of the general fund budget in Vermont. And uh, currently in the projected FY21 budget, uh, this, the education fund has grown to about $1.8 billion dollars. So that bucket, that's a big bucket. And so at the legislature, um, they had to find a way to fill that bucket and eventually started looking to other revenue sources to fill the bucket. So Jeff, do we know, do we have any idea what's not being paid for that needs to be paid for? <laughs> like what is... Um, like what budget got cut in order to add money to the education fund? Like, did we cut roads? Did we cut, you know, mental health? Did we cut, like, what did we cut from those that that money used to go to in order to redirect it to education, I wonder? That's a conversation that occurs at the legislature every year to make a decision about what we as a state are not going to do in order to fill up the education fund bucket. Yep. So that conversation happens in many committee rooms around the legislature. Yeah. So, so that actually, so this brings us around a little bit. Now you and I, we were talking earlier about how it's not just education that's being funded with that funding, right? So it's not that we're taking 65 to 75% of your property taxes and putting it towards education, plus the, um, what is it, the 26% funded to sales and use and then the meals and all this other stuff. What other things are being paid for out of the school budget that caused that to rise so much? That, fun, that, that cost? Well, in my conversations with other school board members in recent years, um, they acknowledge that the school districts have become the default social service agencies in many communities. And so a lot of um, counseling and mental health and other kinds of social what would ordinarily be considered social services are being rolled into the school budget and you know uh, distributed and accessed by community members at and through school. And that's being, a lot of that is being incorporated into school budgets and education funding. Um, well, I, I would like to, to, to build on that. Uh, coming from Winooski, I've seen an evolution where it's not just social services, but also medical services. Uh, even though Winooski has received grant money, well, where does that grant money come from? Taxes. Tax dollars. Um, a, a, a portion of the budget is allocated to a, a doctor on site. Uh, so they're, they, they, with the new buildings that are being constructed, they're yeah. expanding their nurses offices so that they can have a doctor in there as well. They, we also transport students daily, not the same students, but daily off site to go to dental clinics. And then we also have dentists come in to do 
screening. Wait a second. The school is transporting children to dental appointments. Correct. Yes. Okay. So I want to. So I want to just take a moment and I want to step all the way back, and then maybe start again. But we may jump back into this space. No one on this in this town hall is saying that we don't want kids to have medical care and good education and be healthy and well. Because I know when we start talking about money and how, and how messed up the system, the bureaucracy is, it's really easy to start sounding callous and cold, right? Mm -hmm. So I, like, I just wanted to say that. I feel like we have to say that because if you, if you don't, it's like you're a terrible person and you don't care about the children. Um, so we're, we might come back to that again, because oftentimes what I found is when I have try to have conversations about fiscal responsibility in our school system, I immediately get attacked, uh, as if I don't care about the children. Um, wait, Jeff, I don't think you were there. It was at a city council meeting. One of our neighbors that lives over here was like, you don't care about the children. Oh, oh, Erica wants to punish the parents for not doing their job. I mean, she just like went off on me one day and I was like, so me saying that parents should be responsible for their children, mm -hmm. their medical care and stuff like that means I don't care about them. Yes. I, I've heard it myself when I've As a raised, teacher. raised concerns about the responsibility of schools um, providing for children. There was a time when we were in school that our parents were responsible to buy us notebooks and pencils yep. and things of that nature. Uh, the schools are now purchasing those because we cannot ensure that our students will have the materials that they need in order to do their math problems mm -hmm. because they don't show up with pencils. And not that they forget them at home or something, the parents don't know or don't think to get those supplies for the children, even when we're calling and saying, hey, we need these. Well, don't you use laptops and computers? We still need to, you know, scratch out your answers. So then, so then, so here's, and I may be digging and I may be diving in too soon, but this is kind of what we do here. So then how do we have these conversations? Because so much of this is tied up into emotion mm -hmm. and, in a real serious conversation about our culture and our society, where if we're having, if we have such an epidemic of people not caring for their children, that the school has to do it. And I think that, I, I mean, I, I, which I, I don't think is what's happening. I, I don't know that I want to say that they don't care. Uh, I think, again, I worked in two very low, low income. income, low socioeconomic Poverty. schools. Um, number one, they just don't feel like they can. Mm. Uh, you know, there's there's a sort of reasons. Number two, they don't know any better. And then there are the third group, which they're so wound up in their own lives and their own uh, trauma mm. that they're not thinking about their children. They can so, barely think about themselves. And then, so then, is it the role of the school to step in there and fix that? Or is it the role of the community to step in and fix well, that? Well, the argument that comes back for me is, if the schools don't do it, who is going to? Right, and which is what, that's the suffer. justification that they use for everything, stuff. but everything. So I, I think that sort of gets at the, sort of the underlying point to make here is that is that there is there is an efficiency to be gained by providing using the school districts you know as a system and a location for providing these types of social su support services but the real issue is that is that to get to some uh level of awareness and financial or fiscal honesty about what's being paid by whom and how and that so even if you want to support these you know 
community service activities happening at school, the, the bottom line is that those services should be, we should be honest about recognizing and yep. paying for those services out of a human services or a social services budget, not the education budget, budget yeah. because uh, you know where those those resources are taking away from. Although they may support learning, they're being taken away from direct learning activity. Social learning, yeah. So instead of having shop class and civics class and home ec and things like that, we're paying for. Oh no 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 <laughs> no no no! It's and we're still offering the civics class. We're still offering, well, you know. Okay, they are not teaching kids civics. They're not doing, well. well if they're teaching them I'm, civics, they're they not teaching, teaching them civics. Them, they're I, not I, teaching them how the constitution works yeah, that's true. or taxes. Um, but again, anyway. the, the, the schools have become a repository for, well, have the teachers do it, but that's another conversation. Mm. But the reason that budgets, uh, again, I'll speak mostly for Winooski, they keep going through, they keep getting approved and they keep going up every year. Well, and it's not like you're adding more classes, but you're not taking any away. It's because these social services programs, I can't tell you how many behavior interventionists now work at Winooski. Look at the camera. Behavior interventionists. Behavior interventionists? Yeah. So your kid has a breakdown who's got trauma, what do we do? We want him back in class. We don't want to suspend him, her. So we have him or her work with a behavior interventionist to um, try to resolve the inner demons. So, okay, hold on. <clears throat> so I feel like I cut Jeff off. No, that's okay. Did you, hold on, because okay, now I have two things. I'm like, oh, oh, where do I go with this? Did you have something you wanted to finish, Jeff? Um, I would follow up on Shannon's comment in that th there are, I mean, this conversation about interventionists as part of the, you know, the support staff at school. There are, there are a whole cadre of learning you know, subject matter interventionists on in the school budget, as well as the other behavioral interventionists. And, you know, the sort of the argument you hear, you know, when you listen to school board conversations is that we have to, you know, we have to solve the behavioral mental health issues before students can learn. Well, so, now, but so you're, 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 I can interrupt. Oh. I can interrupt. <laughs> I'm the host. Um, I warned him that I would interrupt him. Everyone, I get to interrupt because I'm the host. Make, make it judicious <laughs> then, okay? So um, now, one of the things that I've been really concerned about because you know we have these VA, we have so now that's a <laughs> salary and a benefits oh, yeah. package, probably a very nice salary. Mm -hmm and benefits package. We do live in Vermont. Uh, so it's very expensive for that interventionist. Mm -hmm. Now, how much of the reason for the need for that interventionist is because things like they're passing kids that can't read at grade label, level. So mm -hmm. if you have kids, and we know this is, a, this is a problem in places like that, that you have kids being passed that cannot read or, or are not proficient in skills at their grade level and they're just getting passed. And so, can I say this? Or even close to so, grade level. So you were having to teach high school science, oh, yeah. can I say this? Oh yeah. So Shannon was having to teach high school science, upper level science classes at a middle school level. Or lower. Or lower, because the kids couldn't read. So how much of a behavioral intervention do you need when, right. when you've got a kid who's now being passed and passed and passed, can't do his schoolwork, can't read, probably is getting picked on. How many problems are they getting disciplinary with school? How much of that escalates to the point where now, <laughs> if they had just kept the kid back and done their job as a school system, that kid wouldn't be that way anymore? Oh, I wish it were that, I wish it were that black and white. Uh, okay. I wish it were that black and white. Okay. 
uh, there, there are so many tiers to this issue. However, yeah. Uh -huh. um, sorry, sorry. Now you make me lose my thought. Right. So I, I just want to add to that thought and say that <clears throat> children are not stupid. They <laughs> quickly understand when they're being, you know, when leniency is being applied to their own achievement and behavior. Mm -hmm. And, you know, or, and so the, the more we lower the bar in that regard, we're not really doing them a service. We're doing them a disservice because, because at some point, um, you know, I've heard the argument that, oh, well, we don't want to hold kids back because it's going to impact their self-esteem. Well, after a couple of years of this, as I mm -hmm. said, children are not stupid. They, they quickly learn and experience, you know, fall, what feeling, what feeling, what falling behind is. And that in itself becomes a self-esteem destroyer. This is what I'm saying. And so then we end up needing all these special educators. Every kid has a, what is it called? An IEP? Yeah. Uh, every kid has an IEP, uh, you know, whatever. When in fact, the problem started in at the root, which is the home. Oh, well, that too. We are, we're not even talking about that. Which is the home. We're not even, let's, one thing at a time. Okay. <laughs> um, no, but in, in all seriousness, it is true. Like, we expect our teachers to not only be teachers, but also um, therapists, social workers, uh, disciplinarians, oh, mor morals, apparently, and values. Um, so, uh, Mike says, I have a son with ADHD and need a para sometimes. There aren't enough para at the school. Um, it, um, okay, I can't read that last part, but um, and then he said, they do borrow money from the highway budget to pay for school taxes when there's a budget shortfall. So the, see, this is the thing is we want there to be services for people who need services, right? We want people to be able to have what they need, but it can't be because of superficially created problems that we create out of our school system, right? So it's one thing if we have a paraeducator for kids with ADHD or other problems like that. It's a wholly other thing when we create the problems by not holding them and their parents accountable, right? Did you want to say something, Jeff? Well, I, I can sort of attest um, from sitting in on a number of school board meetings in um, a year or so ago that the Burlington School District, for example, made a conscious decision to remove um, behavioral um, interventionists uh, and learning interventionists from the high school and mm -hmm. shift those positions to the early grades mm -hmm. to you know, one, you know, one, two, and three, you know, in the elementary level with a recognition of some attempt to sort of head off this uh, phenomenon that, you know, develops by, you know, al you know, allowing kids to advance when they're not really meeting grade level. So I have to, you know, say there is some recognition of this phenomenon and some school districts are attempting to deal mm. with that, but whether, whether they have enough resources to actually do that or not. Well, I wonder too about I mean, there are some kids that just should not be in school either. And this is another one of these things. So we're going to get into all the uncomfortable conversations that nobody wants to talk about. You know, when I was a kid, we had the special school that the kids who couldn't get along with other kids had to go to. And it seems more and more like they don't care and they're integrating kids that create problems I think into those regular classrooms. The exceptions though. Is it? I, I, I really do. Okay. After working in two pretty tough schools, I think those are truly the exception. Mm. And 
because you've told me some stories too about kids that you had in your classroom that couldn't even really learn. Yeah. But again, as Jeff said, if we were starting those interventions earlier, mm -hmm. if parents were held accountable to support their children at home, um, it wouldn't get to that point. Yeah. And, and, and again, it can't be the school's sole, solely the school's responsibility mm. to support those children. The parents have to be doing so much work at home. Yeah. Well, that's, I remember. And, and, and when we were in school, our mother read to us. Mm. We did times <laughs> tables at home. Well, that's, Mino said that when he, he got like a B or something like that in math, he got a bad, a bad grade in math and his mom made him do math drills all summer yeah um and again you don't want to make learning a punishment but because that's going to do the opposite but i've asked my students how many of their parents uh engage with them and say hey mm -hmm. what are you learning uh what again kids don't always tell you the truth and you have to take everything with a grain of salt but it just doesn't happen yeah. um I think every student wants to learn. Yeah. I don't think, I believe in my core. It's what is impacting their ability to do mm. that. And this is where the behavior interventionists come in. But again, it can't be the sole responsibility well, of the and that's, school see, to take that on. And that's the thing is we, as a nation, decided at some point that we wanted to provide at least a basic education to our populace, mm -hmm. which I think is good. And I think we should. But why is it other people's job to pay for your kid and your kid's special problems? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that to be, and again, a lot of these conversations sound harsh. Like as an example, I've known kids. Um, yes, it is, Mike, it is a full-time job. It is teamwork. And this is the thing is it used to be that we had a two parent home, you know, we had two parent homes where kids were coming home after school. They had mom at home, more than likely they had mom at home and then dad came home and they had people to help. They had people to read to them. They had these things. They had that stability you know, and, and ways that they were able to support their families. People used to be members of a church or a Lions Club, or a Rotary, and so people helped each other that way, or too. Or grandparents lived nearby. Or grandparents lived nearby, yeah. or in the house, because you had multi-generational like, homes. Let's be serious about this, Erica. That doesn't exist anymore. No. So how are we supposed to, with the, the reality of what we have today, yeah. um, go from where we've gone, you know, from one spectrum all the way to the other, yeah. where there's, again, in my experience, parent, a massive decline in parental involvement. Yeah. Um, and, and. No, so the, the, the answer, expect, hold on. The, the answer the to your question system. is too bad. Is you change the culture. Yeah. The answer is you change the culture. You change the expectation. We have, we have moved away from expecting parents to parent. And. Not only will we moved away from personal responsibility, just well, generally, yeah, yeah. but anyway, okay. So one of the things I really hoped, we, oh, well, let's see, we got some comments here. Discipline is something seriously lacking in modern society. Michael, you are not wrong. I, my, me, you know, my husband, Benjamin, oh, my sweet husband, want, Benjamin, don't want that happening has either. said that the worst thing for people is the lack of fear Wait, how does he say it? I can't, I'm not going to say it right. But basically, like, per, people don't fear consequence anymore. You know, it used to be that if you challenged my honor, we'd go out and fight in the street. There's, or, a, there's a healthy fear, you know, and it doesn't exist anymore. Because yeah. if if you chast, we don't speak, we don't speak our kids me, anymore. I'm going to tell them that you're a racist oh or you're, oh, that happened a lot. I remember when you told me that you couldn't hug your students. Yeah because it might be perceived as something sexual. And then I went to visit you at school. A crying student. And then I went to visit you in school and found a young lady with 
high-waisted yoga pants and a half shirt showing off all of her business and that that was not a violation of any kind of dress code because that would mean that you were sexualizing her and that you were then the problem. Yeah. That is crazy, y'all. That is crazy, crazy, crazy towns. So I want to respond to Mike who said teachers, parents all need to talk, work together and work together. Mike, I would like to say I agree with you. I, I, I don't disagree with you. However, that just doesn't happen. The students whose parents we need to see the most don't show up. We, I, I, would, I would call home to talk to parents about the good things were happening in my programs. And I didn't even get a call back from those. And I, and I know parents are busy sometimes, but these are your children. Okay, we're gonna be careful. Yeah, don't start lecturing people. Yeah, we're not well, lecturing. No, no, people. no. I'm just saying. Yeah, um, it just doesn't happen. Parents aren't involved in their children's education, especially at the high school level. Middle, it really starts in the middle school, but you see decline in involvement with parents. Well, and that's, I mean, okay, well, let's, and that's on. when they need you the most. Yeah. Mm. Okay. We're going to go back. We're going to, we're going to change the topic up here a little bit. Jeff, the universal chart of accounts. Do you want to talk to people about that? What that means? Uh, Tell, tell them about, sorry, I got distracted. Hold on, hold on. So for everybody that doesn't know what a chart of accounts is, because I learned the other day, I said that, and one of my clients was like, I don't know what you're talking about, Erica. And I thought it was something that everybody knew. So for those of you guys that don't know, a chart of accounts is the list of categories that you can um, classify your expenditures to. So it might like office expenses or meals and entertainment or rent or whatever. That is your chart of accounts. And so when we're talking about the state of Vermont and, what, and financial statements, we're talking about a profit and loss, which shows the revenue received as well as the expenses of the state. And then a balance sheet is the assets owned by the state. So that's land, money, cash, other things like that and liabilities, so who we owe money to um, and things like that. So, okay, that is a little accounting 101. I bet you didn't know you were gonna get accounting 101 here. Let's talk about debits and credits. No, we're not gonna do that. So- Do you see my eyes bleeding? Gle my ears glossing bleeding. over. Okay, so Jeff, did, did this did the legislature agree that they were going to do a universal chart of accounts or tell everybody what that whole conversation was about well as this um conversation and awareness about the extent to which school budgets were supporting social services varied in the education budget oh in, yeah in 2019 when when the legislature passed the uh, uh, the Education Funding Act, um, they actually put a provision in there to require school districts to begin to implement a uniform a universal chart of a, a uniform chart of accounts. Excuse me for um, ex expenses and income at school districts because up to that point school districts were tracking their categories of expenses independently and there was no consistency to get at this argument about how much Once. are we spending for x y and z and so starting a year or so ago uh, the agency of education is now implementing that you know school districts are starting to implement a uniform chart of accounts uh, for education funding. So in the coming years, we may be able to have a more articulate conversation about exactly what school budgets are paying for. And then that fosters the conversation, is this the right budget 
for this service or for mm. this practice or for this activity? And should that money, you know, some of these activities be funded in a human services budget? Mm -hmm. Even if we continue to provide them through school districts as a as an efficiency. Well, and that's what I mean, if we had, you know, as an example, if we needed a, a psychiatrist or a dentist, I can't get over that. I we're gonna have to come back to that. <laughs> then you have one or two for a school district instead of one at every school or whatever, where it's you know that work person is part-time in multiple places probably, mm -hmm. and then you can consolidate the services. And, and in terms of using this tool to gain some savings or some efficiency, you can then ask, should, should some of these services, should they be paid for out of our Medicaid budget? Mm -hmm. Should some of these be charged to, you know, families in health insurance if they have it um, so that some of those you know activities or yeah. costs that are being borne by school districts be borne by another pot of money so that money can be spent more directly on learning on education so yes. but this is the question i have for you because this has always confounded me and and maybe you got an answer at some point in your in your research now it's been a while because the internet is is a pr pretty prolific at this point uh, and um, it's ubiquitous, it's but we used to have to buy textbooks every few years. And when I told my principal, we don't need textbooks, he said, you need to spend the money on textbooks because if you don't use it, we're gonna lose it, which was abhorrent to me. Uh, is there any sort of uh, more itemized um, accounting, what did you call it? Accounting charts, chart of chart accounting, accounts. excuse me, chart of accounts, where it's more explicit as to what the funding is being spent on to, to that minutia? Your mind being the budget. Well, I, I think you would, you would have to have your conversations with your district financial officers and to get yeah, yeah somebody's got well, that and see, somewhere, but, that, but that's my concern is I go to school board meetings and there are the school board members, me and maybe one other person. I watch RETN and the play, the, 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 um, the theater is empty. People don't know what schools are spending the money on with the exception of the board members or no. uh, the sometimes the principals and teachers. And how are we disseminating this information We're to not. the larger public? We're not. And then whose responsibilities? <laughs> Mine, yours, yes. the parents? And that, I think that, and Jeff, forgive me, you're, I'm totally speaking and I know nothing, but people just don't take responsibility for any of that stuff anymore. People don't show up. Not that they ever did. But you were going to talk, Jeff, sorry. Oh, well, I was, uh, this sort of goes to the part of our motivation several years back to try to put together this education funding seminar for our community is our underlying or overriding motto, if you will, is this idea of creating an informed and engaged electorate so that people understand, and this goes, you know, far beyond school budgets, but, you know, get an engaged electorate so that people understand what they're actually voting for and to try you know i think the 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 biggest uh way forward to you know solve some of the problems that we are concerned about is for more people to vote it's i have a i was reading a fact sheet from the state tax department um about education funding that said at 
town meeting day uh, a year ago, and I think it was probably the off year election in 2019, that 18% of the registered voters in the state of Vermont voted on town meeting day. That's so sad. It is sad. And well, so, I think about well, Jeff, yeah. not only that, think about how many our two house reps are running unopposed this year. How many of our city councilors ran unopposed this year and last year? We don't have people are unwilling to participate in the process. They don't they don't vote because they don't think it matters anymore. People won't run for office because we're treated so despicably by our neighbors. You know, I mean, especially as a conservative, if you're a conservative, it's like, just know you're going to, everybody's going to call you a racist, sexist, homophobic bigot, and you're probably going to lose your business, you know, you, so people won't participate. But it's, even if they do, do they know what they're participating in and what they're voting for? And it's a resounding no. It seems like with a lot of the education stuff, Shannon, a, a lot of it seems like it is pushed by the, the whims of the day. The passions of the day. I, I think, think that's, that's how the founders. I think that's work. with anything, unless you have uh, a a large um, passion invoking yeah. issue. Voters aren't going to come out. Well, apparently, South Burlington had the most voter turnout ever for this town meeting day this year. <laughs> yep, <laughs> because of the school budget. The budget. And yet it's passed. I mean, it took a, it took another few cycles through, but it still passed and it was huge. It's so crazy. So did Jeff, did you have something that you wanted to add there before I interrupted you? No, because I mean uh, promoting voter turnout is a is another strong interest of mine, but it's uh, sort of takes this conversation off in another direction. <laughs> I know, it's hard not to. It's really hard. Because it's, because here's the thing, is the same problem with voting, is the same problem with education, is the same problem with a lot of things Healthcare. that we're dealing yeah. with in our culture. It's, you know, lack of personal responsibility, lack of participation, lack of knowledge, uh, apathy. Well, yes, yes. But again, like Jess said, if we started having that conversation, we're going to go into a place we <sighs> we're not. Because I know some of it's apathy and some of it's I'm so overwhelmed with my life that this is all yeah, I can Yeah, but think even about. that, but even that though, like, why are you so overwhelmed with your life? Like, what are we doing with our lives if not the things that are most important, you know, taking time with your kids. Like we've created this culture in this society where we have to have an ever bigger house, an ever nicer car. Now that of course is one of those things in Vermont that drives me crazy. If you're poor, you have the, you have the poor tax of having to get rid of your car if it's not up to snuff for people. That's another conversation that makes me angry. But I totally lost my train of thought. Do you want me to smack your head? It will come back. No, it won't. Well, I, I guess I would, you know, to try to tie this back to your theme of education and education funding. Yes. And the whole uh, voter awareness is mm. the, the link between, I mean, folks like to complain about property taxes. Um, without being fully aware of the funding mechanism and then they and then they choose not to vote yeah oh. i mean so, i mean so oh, that's not me. <laughs> that the whole i you know there's this chain of events if you will that you know people need to be aware of how how this stuff works oh this is what i was level you know, and the relationship between the state education fund and the decisions that their local school boards make 
-hmm. and, and, and in many cases, what their school board, local school boards are not capable of impacting on their taxes, and yet people love to blame their property taxes on the school board, uh, but then still not voting. So, yep. And that's what, oh, I lost so, it again. I had it and then I lost it again. I just want to say this. I was able to do a lot of amazing things without spending a single dollar in my classroom. Um, now, when I say that, did I have lights? Did I have the internet? Did my students have one-to-one -one technology? But the best experiences that my students had were when we were in the community, working with the community, and then oh. we would come back and we would design engineer uh, solutions to issues around our city. Yeah. Now, again, does that take some money? Yes, but we didn't need to have the latest and greatest, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It does not, it takes money to educate children. Yes. And expose them. And, and working in the tech center, I'm so grateful for the technology that we have for our students so that they can go into the real world and use the, the industry standard equipment. That's, a, that's different from uh, your average math class right. or uh, right but that's but again what the point that the point or the most important thing in what you said is being in the community mm -hmm. okay this is what happens when our tax dollars get so out of control we say hey we're spending all this money on schools so you know what it is your responsibility you know what I've done my part all right I've paid my taxes now you do your job. I'm not going to worry about the outcomes. Okay. I'm going to be over here doing whatever I want because I've paid you all this money. Thanks. And then people move on with their day. And that's, and so we've disengaged people. We've, we've told people that they don't matter and we've taken them out of the process. Whereas you can do more with less money when actual human beings are actually just being in relationship and working with other human beings. I know this is a crazy concept. It's shocking. You blew my mind. I know, mind blown. But I talk about this all the time. You know, it's like people don't get sober because some government bureaucrat is handing them out Suboxone. People get sober when another human being is willing to get down in the mud with the person suffering and help lift them back out, you know? You can't create a government program big enough to actually, I almost swore, to actually care about people. You can't. You cannot create a government program that will care about people. You can hire caring people. Well, and that leads me to the next piece of the state of education is I worked I'll speak for Winooski and definitely the tech center, but I've only been there a year. Yeah. I have never met a more dedicated group of people, let mm -hmm. alone educators. Uh, and the abuse that is heaped upon them is astronomical. Really? They, oh, from who? From administration, from parents. Mm -hmm. They are students. Uh, students, but you expect that a little bit more. Yeah. But if you have a failing student, it's your fault. Oh, Especially when you get into the high school, you know, you're, you've got to, you've got to get them graduated, but they're coming in at a second or third grade reading, writing, math level, etc. And so if you now they're in ninth grade, don't somehow pull them up to a 10th, 12th grade level. It's your fault. It's your fault. Um, How demoralizing The is pressure. That? I, I, it is why I love teaching. <laughs> because okay, well, hold on. Jeff was saying that. Wait, I know, just know, hold on. She left teaching because y'all suck. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, but seriously, but I just, I want to make sure that was, the pressure was literally breaking me. And I remember you telling me one time that you wanted to go into teaching yeah. because you wanted to inspire kids to love science. And you thought that that was the way that you were going to change the world. And they basically crushed that out of you. Not basically. They crushed I that out of you. Yeah. If, if I didn't leave when I did, 
I don't know if I'd still be sued. Um, and so this is what the, you know, I don't know if I, I have a, I'm a, still in education though, but I found my niche, a way that you can yeah. still be there with kids <laughs> and interact with the kids and laugh with the kids. I miss teaching science though every day. Yeah. Every day. Yeah. My heart, broke, my heart still breaks, but I couldn't be the devil anymore. Mm. Um, yes, because Jeff was saying, you know, when we have such low expectations of our students, and I don't know how many times I've said mm -hmm. this to you, but when you lower the bar so low for the students, it's almost like you don't like them. You, I remember you telling me, this was like 10 years ago. Sorry, Jeff. I remember you telling me that people rise to the level of expectation. Jeff, what was it? exactly the point I was going to make is that um, you know, we, we need to advocate for the theme that expectation is not a dirty word. Yeah. And it is now. What? Just no so way. You know. Where's the school district that said they were getting rid of grades altogether because grades oh, are most racist. Schools, most, oh, racist? Yes. Oh, well, most schools are getting rid of grades. Apparently grades are racist. It was in California somewhere, like San Diego or San Francisco or something. Well, this, I mean, as we move to a, and wait, I'm, hold on, I'm wait, a huge I'm sorry. proponent of wait, proficiency based wait, wait, systems. Wait, 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 did you just say grades are, wait, what? No, grades are not racist. I'm a huge wait. proponent of the proficiency based system. So we're moving away from ABC and can you demonstrate that you know this? Can you demonstrate that you know this? What? And can you demonstrate it to this level, this level, or this level? Long discussion. I don't know. Huge I'm not buying it. it. It's, I'm not buying I've it. I've been doing proficiency. What's the difference between A, B, and C and good and well, you, not that good? You can you can still that assign. That sounds like you're trying to be gentle with your feelings again. No, you can assign very easily. And I did it very easily. <laughs> it wasn't easy, but I did it where I said, okay, I, I created uh, the basically the result no. of this is no a, this is a C, no 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 this is a if B, this is an a. a if this if this is an a if a is B, okay so a is this wait where's the camera oh wait no a oh i forgot equals wait i can't do this backwards <laughs> proficiency okay i can't do this i mean it's still if if the person is proficient so that's still an problem. a do you know how many students i had that when they got to me the parents said, but they're an A student. Well, what They've does that matter? Been... No, what does an A mean? Uh, okay. So if you, if a student sounds like is a poppycock. nice student, oh, but they're so nice and they work so hard and they've tried so hard. So we're going to give them an A. Tell the camera. We're going to give them an A. I want to ask Shannon if if the format being used for performance-based grading, um, if you can make a parallel to a job description. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no problem. You know, this is an opportunity for you to rebut what Erica is saying. Yeah. Because, you know, if, if you structure your performance-based grading system as if it were a, a a job performance or a, yeah. a, a no problem job description. Uh, so okay that's there fair is substance so, there. See the correlation? okay okay so it, well uh, your job says you have to do this this and this and you've only demonstrated that you can do this and this you're not proficient well and so so does this deal with then like the stuff like okay as an example i have friends that are terrible at taking tests I'm a very decent test taker because I have good memorization skills and I'm a nerd. So that is the stupidest thing ever. What? I'm a terrible test taker. Okay. So in a proficiency based system, you should, and if you are meeting the expectations of the standards that are set out, you should be able to pass the test whether whatever kind of test it is, because you're practicing and practicing and practicing. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm as an educator, I'm only asking you to memorize and regurgitate and vomit back, that's a bad teacher. Mm -hmm. My expectation is I'm gonna create an assessment for you that not only do you have to apply the facts, the content, 
but then problem solve with it yeah. and design solutions. Which is how kids used to, we used to get taught critical thinking skills and Did lateral we? thinking skills. Did we? I don't know. It depends on the class. You're I, I feel like I Let got challenged you. with stuff. I mean, not so much. <laughs> Maybe that's because of, because of, it depends on the class and it depends Maybe, on the instructor. Is that just because of the way we were raised by our parents too? Like we're just really you curious. I was a tech kid. Okay, I'm getting nerd. So I'm, ner I'm sorry. I'm nerding out, and I'm just having a conversation with my sister call. now. Um, like we're sitting at the dinner table. Well, and so that is the thing, right? Is like we don't just need people to be able to do two plus two. We need people who can also, if they don't know the answer, how do I go find Correct. the answer? How do I? not lose my mind and learn how to take care of myself in certain circumstances or whatever. And that is usually, I can work with a kid at a second grade reading level. Mm. I can work with that kid Tell them. at a second grade reading level. Mm -hmm. What I can't do is work with a student who says, I'm so overwhelmed, I'm shutting down, I'm putting mm. my head down and I, I've got nothing for mm. you. Uh, I can I can adjust my teaching six ways to Sunday. What I can't do is work with somebody who's just not showing up. Yeah. So, um, Jeff, that hour went by really fast. Is it really an hour? Yeah. Holy we, crap, it's eight o'clock already. So my I want to just make sure that because we kind of went all over the place. We got a lot of talk about the funding done. We talked, when is that uh, chart of accounts due? To my understanding, school, they... districts, school districts are in the process of implementing those now. So I think if you, if you Did want- Did you say there was a deadline? I don't know if there is. I don't remember, okay. The answer to that would be, probably at the Agency of Education to figure out which districts oh, have made progress in terms of implementing the chart of accounts. I, I know, for example, that Burlington um, made the transition prior to that legislation being passed. So- Okay, so, well so there their already own. is a chart of accounts that is expected to be like the template and they're moving currently into that. Yes. Can I ask a clarifying question, Jeff, about this? Did the AOE provide a template for it? Because most school districts will not give up that kind of autonomy. Um, that, <laughs> that, 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 is, that is outside my area of involvement. And so you would actually have to get in touch with the Agency of Education to to get a good answer about that mm, transition. Yeah. We should have all cities and everything on the same chart of accounts so we can read it. Because we get dinged, Bur the city of Burlington gets dinged for the lack of transparency in our financial statements every year. And I've complained about this before. I cannot read our financial statements. That's not good. And I've been an accountant for 20 years. What? Did you lose your roads colored glasses? <laughs> He said, did you lose your rose colored glasses? <laughs> um, or the really, really thick ones <laughs> that have dancing unicorns come through it. Yeah, like, you know, somehow they figure in the middle of a pandemic when we've lost all this revenue that going forward with the Moran plant, redoing the Southwest Parkway and all the other things. Oh, and a new tech center for Burlington Tech. Well, because we're going to be school. turned into a super fun site. <laughs> Did you hear that? That's a possibility. BHS might be considered a super fun site. Yeah, well, BHS won't be, but the tech center, F building. Whatever. And again, that that's hyperbole. Whatever. So having a background a little bit in that makes me feel it's gonna happen. <laughs> where, hey, Mo, where did you go to school? Where did you go to school that you didn't get help from your teachers? I'm just curious. Because I've heard that before. And it's interesting that I think that different schools have different stories. Oh, Mo, no. If your children went to Winooski, um, well, it's different. She, 
um, saying where she went to school. Okay. Uh, yeah, th I, I don't, I don't know. As Erica knows, as my family knows, I gave up at least a solid 10 years of my life. I was in on Saturdays working with students. I was in at seven o'clock at the evening. I was in at seven o'clock in the morning. Well, I was in there at six with kids there at seven. Mm -hmm. um, and I know many educators that do the same thing. Yeah. Um, before we get wrapped up here, Jeff, is there anything else that you wanted to share with folks from the, the um, slides or anything about the school funding? We didn't really talk about that. As, well, um, I just, I would, uh, how much did Act 46 make things worse? Do you that, is, that? that is not my wheelhouse. Okay. All right. I'm just curious because no, no. my understanding is what did you call it? Super students or what was it? Like how you count kids or there was some expression that you used. The equalized student count. Yeah. Yeah. Equalized student what? Okay. So in terms Explain of that, we, we, we often, we as taxpayers think about how many kids walk through the school door every day. Mm -hmm. But in terms of education funding, all of the money is allocated based on this concept of the number of equalized students in a district. And what that means is that, so you start with each kid counts as one. And then, are you still there? Yeah, yeah, yep. we're changing the battery. All right, so each kid counts as one, but then there are several categories where, for example, if a, if a child is on free and reduced lunch, they get an extra 0.1. If they oh. have an IEP, they may get an extra 0.1 or 0.2. And, and then, you know, there's a couple of other categories that add to that. So, this happens on your property. So, so, a, so, a, so one kid walking through the school door may count as one for funding level, and the kid right next to them may actually be 1.3 students. So, everything that you see in terms of education funding is based on not the actual number of kids, but the, the equalized the number of students. So, it's kids plus these additional cost factors that are added on top. So is the attempt then to try to bring more money to the lower income school districts? Well, either lower income or school districts that have additional resource needs, right. whether it be health, mental health, or well, but that could even be just a matter of who is providing it. What do you mean? I mean, like, not all schools provide all the same services, I imagine. Oh, no, this is, this is, this is based on, like, the student who has the ADHD. Yeah. Would be graded mm -hmm. at a 1.2. Right. And then that IEP plus free and reduced lunch, now you're at a 1.5. And so that student is going to get one and I'm making it easy, 1.5% of the total budget. Right, 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 right. But that's, so it's not necessarily, it's so that that child can get the services he or she needs while at the school. So supposedly right. that money is supposed to go to that student. Well, right, but that's what I'm saying. Right, so it doesn't. But if, but this, but not all schools offer all the same services. No, so. Yes and no, they're supposed to. Really? Oh yeah. Yeah, maybe not the dental clinic. Yeah, I was going to say, like, but what, that, like, no, Fletcher, no, no, no. Fletcher Elementary probably isn't driving their kids over to the dentist's office. The fact that. No, but they, they would have the dentist come to them. This is so wild. I can't. My so if there, hurts. if there is uh, evidence that there are, there is a lot of dental disease in Fletcher, they can apply for a grant to have these programs come in. 
So those are those kinds of things are paid for by grants, not necessarily some, education some, budget. Some again, it depends. Well, the reason that this has is significant is because um, when you get to the when the legislature gets to the step of setting homestead tax rates and um, you know based on school budgets that <clears throat> it all depends on whether your school what your school district is spending per equalized student has a direct impact on your property tax rate my brain hurts yes right there's so... there's obviously more complication than we sh can or should go into this evening but well and it's that, one of those... that's part of what creates discrepancy between school districts in their access to funding and i just have to say if you can't understand something and how it all works and the, all the moving parts and pieces then maybe it's a little too complicated and should be when the government unfortunately that causes people to disengage which is in the exact opposite consequence yeah well and that's what there's so many of these things that i go i don't want to think bad of people but it's hard not to feel like it's intentional almost do you know what i mean like at well, a certain I, point i think it's uh, you know that, that the whole adage of good intentions and mm. the road to hell oh yeah 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 well, and that's what oh, because there was oh, a hey, discrepancy. You know what? Little, hey, little Fletcher Vermont. Hey, didn't have this program isn't to... working. Here, let me give you some more money. Yeah, I take it. Oh, we're doing a skit. Oh, we're doing here a skit now. now take here's some more money. Oh, that thing's still not working. Wait, let me give you some more money. Oh, it's still not working. Let me just. I hope she didn't need that. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is very dramatic, but um. <laughs> Seriously, that's what we do. We just go, oh, we're not going to look and, and discover what's not working about what we're trying to do. We're just going to say that oh, we'll just throw more money at it. And then we don't have to, and that again, and then if we just throw more money at it, then I can turn my back and not be responsible for it because someone else will do it. Oh, it makes me so crazy. Okay. Did you know there was a soapbox under here? I'm on my soapbox. Okay, so uh, did you know I, I actually hosted an event many years ago called the Soapbox Forum? Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Soapbox Forum. But I don't remember yesterday. Every day is Blur's Day. Blur's Day. That is, I've never heard that before. I've said it only like 400 times in the That's last week. pretty funny. And I'm going to use that. So the confusion play. Benjamin funny. says the confusion play. That's what it is when they they don't want people to participate yeah. they make it so that people don't want to participate that's my select board in my town oh my god well and that's and now you know we have burlington the city of burlington having meetings violating open meeting laws that's every time. doing things behind closed doors that's every time i mean you said grand isle's really bad yeah. about that right yeah but even winooski when i was working with the town manager uh she was amazing she would, um, when I started running for town office stuff in, in my own town, um, she met with me and I said, these are the things that I'm seeing. And she said, oh, Shannon, oh, Shannon. Simple, simple, naive Shannon. Mm -hmm. That happens everywhere. I'm debating putting up a video about the swampy politics of Burlington. Yeah, I've edited it, but I haven't There's, decided if I'll put it up or not. Go to a even smaller town. There is no degree of separation. The nepotism and incest in small town Vermont. <laughs> Focus, grasshopper. Ah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. So it is now eight sixteen. So we're gonna wrap it up. Uh, we are doing virtual town halls every Monday and Saturday from now until the election. You can find out information on my website at ericareddick.com or ericaforsenate.com. I know it's crazy. Uh, both of those go to the same place. Um, there are links uh, or go to uh, generally irritable 
on Facebook, Generally Irritable with Eric Reddick. That also has my events page. Um, you can donate to the campaign. Go to ericreddick.com and donate. Advertising. We need some advertising these last couple of weeks. We need to figure out how to mo motivate all the people who are like, screw this, I don't want to vote. I'm not going to vote. I had somebody tell me that this weekend. I'm not going to vote. Get your guns and go house to house and and threaten people. Threaten I don't people. think that's legal. No, you, you know, you round them up and you. Bring yeah, them by I think that's maybe ballot harvesting and probably highly illegal. That might be even kidnapping or something. You asked for a solution. <laughs> if you're going to shoot it down, <laughs> get it, shoot it. But I'm fine. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Jeff Comstock, again. Uh, everybody, Jeff is my neighbor here in the New North End, and he and his wife are awesome, and he's really smart. And One, one, one last thought, Erica. Yeah. <clears throat> Politics is not a spectator sport, or neither is democracy, for that matter. Amen. Democracy is not a spectator sport. Yeah, everyone should be on the field this year. Uh, if everyone should be on the field every year. Don't be a ref on the sideline telling everybody what they're doing wrong. Get in the game. Volunteer for a campaign. We're doing lit drops, targeted lit drops this week and this weekend uh, where we're catching, uh, we, we're getting the list of people and households that have not voted yet. And we're doing a targeted lit drop this week. So if you've got an hour or two, uh, direct message me, call me, text me, email me, however you know how to get in touch with me. Uh, if you've got an hour or two, I'll give you a walking list and some flyers to put up in some different neighborhoods around Chittenden County. Um, but, and if you don't live around here, I've got a lot of people who have participated. Um, oh yeah, Mino says stop reffing. And I totally lost my train of thought. She said no. Oh yeah, come do flyers an hour or two. Stop talking, Benjamin, you're distracting me. My handsome husband is texting. Say goodnight, Erica. Commenting, what's that? Say goodnight, Erica. Dang it, Jeff, say, oh yeah. Benjamin says hi, Jeff. All right, everybody, uh, Jeff Comstock, thank you for joining us. Shannon Bundy, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Talking welcome. about education and good Support your night. teachers. Oh yeah, do that too. Okay, hold on now, nobody's saying anything. But not with money, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, maybe with money. I'm kidding. Candy? In the right way. Um, oh, chocolate. Okay, don't say anything embarrassing, I'm stopping. <laughs>